When I was nine years old, my mom married the man that I call dad, and I ended up being part of a wonderful French-Canadian Métis family. And that's how I ended up with the last name Lamoureux. That's how I ended up with the last name as a Canadian member of parliament. So if you're Googling this in the future and you come across this video, you're watching on YouTube and you were looking for that Kevin Lamoureux, I'm not him. And it's, it's easy to tell us apart. There's an easy way to tell us apart. One of us is devilishly charming, charismatic, good-looking, reasonably intelligent. The other's a politician. So let's get that record straight moving forward. That's, that's the difference. Now, of course, I say that with jest and, and with all love in my heart, and there was nothing partisan about that. Now, when I uh, think back on that time in my life when I became a Lamru, when I became part of this new family, one of the things that stands out in my memory is how hard my father's family, my Ojibwe family, tried to keep in touch with me over the years. They still do to this day. They still reach out and try to keep in touch with me just so that we're in each other's lives. One of the things that we talk about in education is the importance of belonging for children. I'm very lucky that I never had to question where I belong. That's a wonderful gift that I've been born with. Now, one of the reasons that they put this effort in is because they were afraid that over the years I was going to forget about where I come from, that I would lose my heritage, that I would lose my culture. And there's a very good reason for this. Historically, of course, as we know, Canada has not always been friendly for Indigenous identity. And far too many young people, far too many children even today, find themselves in a situation where they either never have the opportunity to learn or forget about what it means to be Indigenous. Now, I was very angry about this as a teenager. As a young person, I was very frustrated about this. And without having any knowledge about how we came to be inside of this broken relationship, I just realized that there was something wrong with Canada. When the outward beauty of Canada, there was something wrong underneath this. Without understanding how we came to be inside of these broken relationships, oftentimes I blamed Indigenous communities for not having the answers. And so I gravitated towards anger. I identified with rage. And I grew up in an age where, and many Canadians will be able to relate to this, I grew up in an age where I was surrounded by some pretty confused ideas about what it meant to be a man or to be manly. I grew up in an environment where I was designed and, and raised to be a blunt instrument of aggression in my continuing effort to try and prove my masculinity and maintain my masculinity. And so when I was a teenager, a group of people reached out to my family and they asked if they would be able to take me hunting. And they wanted to reach out to me and, and, and include me in this event and, and bring me out hunting because, again, they were confused and worried. They were worried that I was going to forget how to be an Indigenous person. So they asked my family if I could join with them, and I was, I was thrilled. I was happy about this because, for me, this seemed like a great way to once again be a part of something manly with manly men. I love the idea of carrying a gun. I love the idea of going out and doing manly things. And so I jumped on the opportunity to be a part of this. Now, the day came to go with my family. It was around November, of course, because it was hunting season. And they picked me up. And I don't know if you know anything about Indigenous communities. But if you've ever had the opportunity to be with Indigenous people, you know that we like to tease. That's one of the things that's pretty standard. In fact, we love to tease. In fact, it's really a sense of belonging when you realize that you're being teased and, and you're part of that in-group. But if you're not familiar with it, if you're not used to it, it can be somewhat unsettling, to say the least. And the teasing began right away. And I'm not going to lie to you, it, it, it stung. It stung. But I wasn't going to let on that I had hurt feelings or that I was feeling uncomfortable. Because again, I wanted to prove how tough I was, that I was a part of this community. And so we got to where we were going, and, and we unloaded, and they put a rifle in my hand, and they began to give me a tutorial on how to behave, how to hold a gun safely, how to aim down the scope, how to be aware of where the other hunters were. And I paid attention, because again, I wanted to prove to them that I fit in, that I was a part of this. And we set out, and I was so excited about this exciting opportunity to be a part of something so masculine as hunting. Now, I don't know if you've ever been hunting, but the defining characteristic is not excitement. In fact, it was really boring. So we set off, and for a number of hours, there was really nothing going on except me and these thoughts wondering when the manliness was going to happen. <laughs> All that really happened was I got cold. So a couple hours into the event, I was leaning up against a tree, and, and, and my mind was wandering, and I was starting to be frustrated with this whole event, and I caught a glimpse of movement about 200, 250 yards out in the distance. And I looked in that direction, and there was a deer. And I quietly unslung the rifle from my shoulder, and I raised it up to butt against my, my arm and uh, looked out down the scope at this animal. And all of a sudden, this animal that was way out there was right here in front of me. I could see it up close. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a deer up close, but they're beautiful. And all of a sudden, I could see this beautiful creature so up close in my imagination, it was like I could reach out and touch it. If you've ever heard the saying, doe-like eyes, 
There's a reason for that, because they have big, beautiful black eyes. And I was looking at this creature's beautiful black eyes, and I could see its hide, and I could see the muscles underneath its hide, and I was just mesmerized by the shape of it. It was, uh, had steam coming out of its nostrils. I could see its ear twitching, which each movement, and it was looking around, and it was absolutely adorable. And in this moment where I was admiring the beauty of this animal, it dawned on me, I'm supposed to kill this creature. That's why I'm here. And so I began to recount the tutorial I'd gotten on how to use my weapon. And so I took a deep breath. And you know, if you've ever been hunting, the idea is that you do the inhale, you start to exhale, you pull the trigger on the exhale. And you're looking for that moment in between heartbeats when your body is at its stillest. And so I took in my breath and I exhaled. And I got all the way through my exhale and nothing had happened. I was still too caught up with how beautiful this creature was. But immediately what happened is I started to feel ashamed. I started to realize if I don't pull this, tr this trigger and shoot this animal, they're all going to laugh at me. I'm going to be ashamed. They're not going to invite me out again. I'm going to be embarrassed. And I started to feel frustrated with myself. I wasn't living up to my own idea of what it was supposed to be to be a man. And so I took that inhale again, determined, resolute, that this time I was going to pull the trigger. And I started the exhale. And I got all the way through and nothing happened. And now I'm really angry. And I'm really starting to get frustrated, but at the same time I'm starting to feel panicky because I really don't want to have to shoot this animal. I really don't want to have to end this creature's life. And I feel like I'm trapped in this situation where I either continue to enjoy this beautiful creature or I do something that I don't want to do, but I'll be humiliated. I'm frustrated. And I to heck with it, this time I'm going to do it. And no matter what happens, no matter what the consequence, I'm here, I don't want to be made fun of, I don't want to be not included anymore, and so I decided this time, no matter what, I was going to pull the trigger. And I took my breath, and I started to exhale, and I heard that thunderous clap of a rifle shot. And I saw the animal rock, and then I saw it start to stagger. It wasn't me that had taken the shot, it was one of my uncles that saw it off in the distance, I hadn't realized. And he called for us to come over, and I started to run over to where he was, and I, I ran up to him. I arrived just a couple of seconds after him, and as I approached this animal and I saw it lying on its ground, I could see that it was still alive because its body was moving, and I started to cry uncontrollably. And I got up a little bit closer, and I knelt down beside where this animal was lying, and I put my hand on it, and I could feel its body, and I started to cry even harder. And I realize now, not then, I realize now, looking back on it, that for all the teasing that went on that day, no one laughed at me for crying in that moment. No one made me feel silly for showing emotion at the loss of this animal's life. No one made me feel like less of a human being because I was so sad about the finality of death and the situation for this animal that had given its life so that we could have food. And I realize now, not then, that in that moment, that's the man that they were trying to teach me to be. That's the indigenous person they were trying to remind me was my duty. Now, this story is important to me because I work in the area of reconciliation. And in an age where that word has become so politicized, it's become so complex, it's become so misused, it's become so controversy, I need to remember stories like that so that I don't get lost in all of that controversy. For instance, it's my belief that we wouldn't be talking about reconciliation at all. I don't believe that we would be having conversations about reconciliation in Canada if it was not for the courage and the bravery and the dignity of residential school survivors. If it hadn't been for residential school survivors having the courage and having the dignity to stand up and recount and hold the government to account for that history, we wouldn't be talking about residential schools at all. This history would still be as lost and invisible today as it was 20 years ago. We wouldn't have just come across this and started to have these conversations. And so I believe that reconciliation is a gift. And because of the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement of 2005, which created space for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, we have this gift to be able to talk about reconciliation. It's incredible to me. It's incredible to me to think that residential school survivors, and if you know nothing else about residential schools, understand this. They were very bad. And it's incredible to me that as children, these people could have experienced the very, very worst that Canada has been guilty of. And yet somehow inside of themselves, they found the courage and the strength and the wisdom to grow to be the kind of people that could extend their hand in friendship back to that very same country, to me, is incredible. What that tells me is that Indigenous communities are very, very strong. Very strong. What that tells me is that inside of indigenous communities, inside of the teachings of the ancestors and the elders, and inside of the people, is the courage and the strength to overcome anything. 
The other thing that I have to be reminded of is that reconciliation is not something that we're now doing, and we in this context being Canada. It's not something that we're doing out of pity for Indigenous people. I think that's an entirely untrue statement. I think that that's a falsehood. Instead, I believe that reconciliation is something that was given to Canada by residential school survivors so that our country could have an opportunity to heal itself. I believe that reconciliation is an opportunity for Canada to accomplish being the country that it is always intended to be. For example, I'm going to tell you a story about one of the best days I've ever had in my life. Now, if we were going around the room and we were to talk about the best days that we've ever had in our lives, I can count on certain answers. There's certain examples that are going to be pretty typical around the room. For many of us, it's going to be what? The day we got married. And if that's the case, congratulations, mazel tov for that. That's fantastic. <laughs> but listen, I'm also of an age, I'm also of a demographic where maybe the best day of your life was the day you got divorced. And if that's the case, congratulations for that too. Fantastic. <laughs> maybe the best day of your life was the day your kids were born. I'm a daddy. I understand that. I'm also told it's a pretty great day when your kids move out, if they ever move out. Maybe that's the best day of your life. <laughs> Well, I got to enjoy one of the best days of my life very, very recently. It was actually June 2nd, 2015. I got to be in Ottawa, Ontario for the release of the final report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And what was it happened that day when we were given that final report? I was at the public gathering that was outside and I got to hear the beautiful words of people talking about Canada reclaiming its dignity, about healing from a difficult past. I got to see people that were wearing bright red t-shirts that said survivor and not be ashamed of that, not be locked in the past. I saw these incredible gestures of beauty and friendship and love and possibility, the idea of leaving behind a better country for our children than the one that we inherited. And what happened that day that was so wonderful for me was that we were given a gift. And I want to be very clear about who I mean when I say we. I'm looking each of you in the eyes in the audience as brothers and sisters, and I'm saying you and I were given a gift that day. And the gift that we were given that day, by my estimation, are the 94 calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. These calls to action that I've been referring to ever since as our roadmap home. This is our way back to the country that should have been there for us when we were born or when we came to this country. It's our way back to the country that we would want to leave behind for our children. And so what I've been asking all Canadians to do and what I'm asking of you and even into the future if you found this video online is to read the calls to action if you haven't yet. They're available online. You can find them for free. But as you read through the 94 calls to action, this roadmap that we've been given, I'm asking all Canadians to think about two very simple questions, and I'm going to share them with you here today. The first question, very simple, without being simplistic, why is this being asked of us? And I think if we can answer that question for ourselves satisfactorily, for every one of the 94, that that's going to serve as the truth part of truth and reconciliation. And I think, I don't know if this is true for you or not, but I think that for many of us, it's going to expose us to stories of Canada that we didn't grow up with. And if that's true, if this journey exposes you to truths that you've never heard before, I want you to understand that that's not your fault and you need not feel guilty about that. But if you do hear these stories for the first time, there may be many moments where you feel very frustrated. And there may be many moments where you feel very angry. I'll give you an example. There is a very, very important Canadian by the name of Cindy Blackstock. And if you don't know who Cindy Blackstock is, I strongly encourage you to learn about her. She's one of the most important Canadians alive today. And she talks a lot about call to action number three. And it reads like this. We call upon all levels of government to fully implement Jordan's principle. Now, if we're going to answer that first question about that call to action, we would have to know what Jordan's principle is. And we would have to know who Jordan was. And we would have to know what happened to him when he was born in 1999 in a community called Norway House, very, very ill. Airlifted from that community and brought to Winnipeg where he was stabilized at the Children's Hospital at the Health Sciences Centre. Brought to a point where he could return home so long as he was to receive ongoing care. A service that would be provided for most of us in Canada almost immediately. But because he was First Nations living in a First Nations community and because our First Nations brothers and sisters are governed by a different healthcare system than you and I, the government argued on who was going to pay the bill. And they argued and argued and argued for five years. Well, this kid lay in a hospital bed, able to go home, ready to go home, watching kids come in and out of that hospital, allowed to go home because they were born a different race in this country until he died. And after he died in 2005, every level of government took a look at that and said, we will never let that happen again. And they called that commitment Jordan's principle. But of course, our government has failed to live up to that commitment on almost every opportunity it's had to do so. 
There's a community on the East Coast, and I just met a young man that came from that area, talked to me about the legacy of this, that almost bankrupted itself, taking the government to court to fight for something that was already promised to them. And then you would have to learn that our federal government today spends more money litigating against First Nations than any other group on the face of the planet, including corporations that poison our water and destroy our land. Now, if you hear that story for the first time, my friends, you may feel angry or you may feel sad. But I think it's time that we all heard Jordan's story. And so the second question I'm going to ask you to think about is this. Would our society, would our community, would Canada be better or worse if this call to action were fulfilled? Now, you can imagine that I have a certain bias in this regard. I'm not going to try to shove an opinion down your throat. Instead, I'm going to invite you to consider your own truth, because if you believe that we would be better for the implementation of these calls to action, then you have an opportunity. And the opportunity is this. Even though you didn't create the problem, you get to be part of the solution. And that's the gift that's been given to us through the calls to action. We've inherited a very unhealthy country. We live in a country where it's still possible to hear people say things like this. Why don't they just get over it? That is not the symptom of a healthy society. That's the symptom of a very unhealthy society. So many of these calls to action are about education. And the reason for that is because many Canadians have either forgotten or have never had the opportunity to learn that Canada is the story of a coming together to people. That's what it means to be Canadian. Now, this is important for me to remember because I hear a lot of people say that reconciliation isn't possible because there has never been conciliation. Now, that may be true in our own lifetimes, but historically that is simply just not true. That ignores the fact that our, our European visitors that came to this part of the land were completely dependent on their indigenous hosts, their partners in nation building. That there was so much cooperation and intermarrying that we created a whole new culture and language of people, as the Métis can attest to. Right? And so together, through treaty making, we laid down the spirit and intent that was supposed to be something beautiful. But because of the Indian Act and the mindset that created it and the mindset that allows it to continue even to this day, we were robbed of an opportunity to reach our full potential. We were left with these wreckages of broken relationships. Now, for me, I've been told many times that reconciliation is dead. And it's very, very disheartening to hear that. I've heard a lot of people say that in the face of ongoing frustrations when it comes to true freedom and true um, equitable opportunity in Canada. I felt it when we heard the uh, verdict of Gerald Stanley, who had murdered Colton Bushy. I felt it again when Cormier was set free, who had been accused of the murder of Tina Fontaine. I felt it just recently when I read the report of the last 48 hours of Tina Fontaine's life, who was last seen just outside the University of Winnipeg before she disappeared forever. That sense of being completely defeated. But then I remember that I come from people who, as children, could have experienced the very, very worst that Canada has been guilty of and yet still found some way to grow to be the kind of people that could extend their hand in friendship back to Canada. I remember the water protectors who stood in defense of your living planet at Standing Rock. I remember the land defenders. I remember the strength and the teaching of the wisdoms of elders in this community. I remember all of the efforts that we've made to try and contribute to a healthy country. And I think about that deer that got shot all of those years ago. And I can't help but wonder if Canada would be different if we had that kind of a relationship with the living world. I can't help but wonder if we would be better off if every loss of life that we experienced came with a sense of grief and a sense of loss and a sense of responsibility and duty. I wonder if we would still be so eager to crisscross our country with pipelines. Or I wonder if maybe because of the teaching of elders, maybe through this maybe last opportunity we have to really engage in the relationship that should have been our birthright, that maybe we can accomplish something beautiful together, finally. That we can accomplish being that country that is truly worth standing on guard for. And so I say to you, thank you, miigwech, gigawabam, and minawa. Uh, I wish you all the best. <laughs>